Okay, we're going to get started. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, my name is Bulong Ramiz Hall. I use she, her, hers pronouns. I am the director of the Emily Taylor Center for Women and Gender Equity at the University of Kansas. Um, our center seeks to engage and empower members of the KU and Lawrence community at large to act in ways that promote intersectional feminist change through programming um, and um, gender equity and identity work. Um, we believe that um, engaging our community to empower, um, to act for social change is fundamental to our goal for gender equity. Um, it is also very important for us that we center um, those on the margins of the margins in our community. What that means is that we focus on uplifting the voices of women of color, Black, Indigenous women, trans women, non-binary folks, um, mothers, um, people who are parenting, um, low-income women, um, women with disabilities, um, and other femme folks at the, on the spectrum of gender. Um, and so that's a little bit about the Emily Taylor Center. I want to talk to you a bit about this program, which um, was the brainchild of our assistant director, Megan Williams. Um, this year, 2021, um, we are taking on the uh, Free Black Women's Library uh, Reading Challenge. Um, and the Emily Taylor Center for Women and Gender Equity will be partnering with the Office of Multicultural Affairs and the Raven Bookstore, which is uh, one of our local bookstores, to uplift the voices of Black women, femme, and non-binary writers by creating um, a virtual programming series around the Free Black Women's Library's annual reading challenge. So bi-weekly on Tuesdays from 12 to 1, on our Instagram account um, starting on January 26th through uh, December of this year, we will be reading um, excerpts from books written by Black women. Um, and all of the people who will re be reading these books are Black women in our communities. Um, and so we're inviting Black women, femmes, and Black non-binary folk at KU, um, including students, staff, faculty, KU alumni. Um, if you identify as a Black woman or femme and want to participate, we have a sign-up sheet on our Facebook page um, and on our website. Um, the categories are listed and you can pick a book and read excerpts um, live um, in community with us. I will be kicking us off um, reading Revolutionary Mothering on the 26th, um, which I'm super excited about. Speaking of which, my little one is here, so she'll might make an appearance a couple times. She just woke up from her nap. Um, and so I'm so excited to be to be a part of this um, this project. So to introduce our guest speaker, Ola is a Brooklyn-born multidisciplinary artist specializing in collage, paper making, print making, and installation. She is also the creator and director of a social art project and interactive installation entitled The Free Black Women's Library. This project features a traveling collection of over 3,000 books, as well as monthly free public programming that explores a wide array of themes, subjects, and ideas that explore the intersections of race, gender, art, class, and culture. The mission of this project is to center and celebrate the brilliance, diversity, and creativity of Black womanhood. In addition to offering literary guidance and support to readers, scholars, and educators, the library also distributes mutual aid grants to single Black mothers via the Sister Outsider Relief Grant. The library is also currently raising money via GoFundMe for a reading room, a book mo mobile, and a librarian. So you can check out the free blackwomenslibrary.com and I'll put that link in the chat. Um, it's also on the Facebook event page if you're in there. Um, and you can check out more about how you can get involved in that initiative and if you have the ability to um, donate some money to the, the Free Black Women's Library. So, um, Ola, thank you so much for being here with us. Um, are you ready to get started? 
Yes, I'm so excited. <laughs> I'm like bursting, like, oh my goodness. I love what y'all are doing with this challenge. Like, I just love it so much. It just makes yes. my like, little librarian heart is just <laughs> floating right now. It's so cool. It's so cool. Thank you so much for having me and thank you for, um, you know, taking this baton and like running with it. Like, Oh, it's so good. I'm so excited to see the videos, um, the posts, the books. I, I just, yes, awesome. Yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm so excited that we're doing this. I, I wonder if you might just start by telling us a little bit about yourself and then why this challenge? Well, um, a little about me. Um, I'm from Brooklyn and I am a nerd. I am a book lover. I am a lover, lover of libraries. I am a lover of like reading and communities. And, you know, I also, um, and I'm an artist and I also identify politically and probably artistically as well as a black feminist slash womanist, right? So I wanted to figure out a way to just um, do something that kind of centered all these different things that I love and figure out how to mash those things together um, and engage with other folks and build community around those things. Um, and I really wanted to do something that centered uh, Black women as far as like our creativity and our brilliance and our diversity and uh you know people say this all the time black women are not a monolith but like literally the literally the library is illustrates that fact you know um black for me blackness is global so we have black women writers represented from the caribbean from the continent from the uk from brazil from all over the world and each one of them is bringing something that's connected to Black womanhood, but they're also bringing their own specific thing. And I just wanted to kind of celebrate that. Like, I really wanted, you know, it was like taking a megaphone and wanting to amplify that. Like, look at how amazing and diverse and creative and brilliant Black women are. Like, read these books, you know, and from doing the Free Black Women's Library Project, I definitely uh, dealt with a lot of people who have like specific reading personalities, right? Like you have people who come to the library and they're like, I'm looking for nonfiction, his like history. Yes. And they just stay in that section and that's where they do their trades and their exchanges and their research and their picture taking and their annotations and, and then they leave. <laughs> You know, um, the people who are looking for erotica specifically or like books on spirituality and self-help specifically and all those things are super awesome. But one of the things I even realized from doing this challenge is like the importance of expanding what you read, you know? So that's why I thought it would be interesting to have a challenge where you have all these different categories and you're kind of forced to step outside of your comfort zone as far as like what you like to read and you end up ex you know being exposed to something that can really shift your perspective um that can really teach you something that can really touch you in a certain way that you maybe may not have been exposed to you know mm -hmm. and i experienced that from doing the challenge myself because like i never read romance novels <laughs> And now I have such a softness and the tenderness and the appreciation for romance, even though it's like not my thing, mm -hmm. but I understand why it's important and why it needs to exist. Um, you know, I kind of stayed in this sci-fi black feminist zone for most of my reading, but now it's like I started to read memoirs and autobiographies and not necessarily like black feminist memoir, but just, you know, random women, uh, women who are talking about addiction or moving through a divorce or a health mm -hmm. crisis. And I'm being exposed to like the intimate details of another person's life and really 
feeling of connection and learning from them. So now it's like, I love memoirs. Like I, that's one of my favorite genres now, which was not the case. So, Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I feel that to say that uh, I think the challenge is a special thing for readers to experience. Mm -hmm. And um, even if you have been reading Black women your whole life, um, it could still expose you to a writer that you may not have never encountered before. And then for the people out there who are doing the challenge who never read Black Women Writers, um, which is a thing that really exists, um, you know, they're getting to also experience a new awakening and a new understanding of how tunnel visions Mm -hmm. exist. So, Mm -hmm. yeah, I answered your question. Yes, absolutely. You totally did. And it's so interesting. I, you know, I, married an English major and my husband is an avid reader and actually gave me my first Toni Morrison book. Um, And it's so um, sad, I think, for how many of us go through this kind of, specifically in the United States, our U.S. educational system, and never read literature by a Black woman. And I can say for me, you know, as a Black woman who went to predominantly white schools where my family thought I was getting this exquisite education to have not been exposed to the voices of, you know, people who were speaking about my experiences or the experiences of my my grandmother, my great grandmother, um, there's a loss there. There's a deep loss. And so... I'm one very grateful that this challenge exists for those of us who are seeking to kind of connect and and reclaim some of that and find our own voice in some of these books, but also for people who think they've read it all and they have not, (laughs) you know, they have not. There's just such a breadth of, um, of literature and voices. And as you said, black women are not a monolith, right? Um, So there's so much out there for people to explore. Um, you said, you'd, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say that I think doing this challenge could, could lead somebody to finding their favorite writer. Yeah. And it could be someone who you would have never even heard of Mm -hmm. and hadn't done it. So, you know, and it is, and it always surprises me when I meet people who've never read a Black Mirror writer, um, but then I realized that I'm kind of in a bubble in New York and I'm kind of in a bubble during this project. So I'm just like, okay, here's a list to read all of these. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we can have a conversation, you know. But yes. yeah, Tony Morrison is a must. Yeah, I was just naming that I, um, after I got hired, uh, Tony Morrison passed about a month after mm-hmm. and we ended up renaming the library in her honor um, in oh. our center. So it is now the Toni Morrison Memorial Library. Yeah. Okay. Wow. That's Mm -hmm. beautiful. Yes. Yes. That's beautiful. Yeah. Um, She is on the list uh, of the challenge. Mm -hmm. Uh, Part of the challenge is reading one of her books, you know, so um, I think that's always, uh, people always like, which one? I'm like, it doesn't matter. Yeah, it, it could be Song of Solomon, it could be Beloved, it could be Sula. Just read one, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No, so that you understand her importance as a writer because they're all of her work is incredible. Incredible, yes. So, when you um think about doing this challenge yourself, I know you said you got introduced to romance. Um, what is you know, what is a book that you will pick up? every year, you know, something that you're like, I will read this over and over and over again. Oh, wow. If you have one. <laughs> I don't know if I have one. I'm, one book that I find myself reading that repeatedly is mm-hmm. Parable of the Sower, yes. Octavia Buckley's book. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, I find myself reading that repeatedly because I find myself referencing it repeatedly. And most especially now in this time that we're in and all the things that are happening in that book kind of feel very 
similar to the mm-hmm. things that are happening now. Mm-hmm. So it's a little bit kind of wild and prophetic uh, to me because the characters are in the book are, you know, like outside is literally feels like an unsafe place, just being mm. outside. Mm-hmm. And that's something that I think people can relate to and I can also relate to, um, you know, and also the random kind of violence and the racialized violence and like the bitterness and the anger mm-hmm. that is taking place in the world and in, in, in that world is feels kind of like, oh, like how did Atikia know that, you know? Yes. Uh, she yes. Talks about, I saw an interview where she talked about how she was inspired to write the book after like the uprisings after Rodney King mm-hmm. and how that's what led her down the path. And I'm just like, wow, she's so such mm-hmm. a genius and so deep. So I definitely find myself referencing that because, you know, not just because of the chaotic aspect of the world, but also because of the main character mm-hmm. and the way she moves through the world, right? And the way she builds community along the way as she's moving through the world and the way she kind of creates her own belief system and her own, um, her own boundaries and her own uh, uh, kind of just model. Like she self-actualizes her life and she's a black woman and she has the same name as me. So, you know, hey. Um, and in the, you know, and in the end, well, well, no spoilers for people who haven't read it. But either way, um, I do find myself kind of flipping through that every once in a while because, you know, you have the earth seed verses at the beginning of each chapter. And, um, you know, I think about, like, I made up a little song <laughs> from the earth seed verses. Yes. And, sometimes, and sometimes I kind of hum it to myself when I'm feeling like I need to just kind of ground myself and center yeah. myself and not feel super uh, distracted and frustrated by the ways of the world. Mm-hmm. So, um, yes. so yeah, I think Parable of the Sower is probably like a go-to again and again. Yeah. Um, and mm-hmm. Especially times, in these times, yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And there are times when I might just like do um, like a, a poetry, what I call like a poetry divination. Mm-hmm. I'll just pick up like a collection of poems and flip through and like find a poem and just kind of read it and see if anything comes up mm. every once in a while with my That's beautiful. I love that. Yeah, I love yeah. That. Yeah. I'm flipping through this book. Um this one. Um, it's called I Can't Talk About the Trees Without the Blood. Wow. And it's by mm-hmm. Tiana Clark. This cover is so intense. And yeah. then it is so intense. Woo. So I was flipping through this one um, like two days ago. Just Yeah. I love the idea of using that as divination and like seeing what comes up and what does it call for you? You know, I think as, as spiritual beings, as people connected to the earth, there's so much that can be, um, so many messages that we get from poetry. And um, oh, yeah. that's just such a beautiful practice um i think i'm also i'm gonna pop in the chat real quick i imagine you follow adrian marie brown who is also a huge oh, fan yeah. of fairful the sower <laughs> oh, yeah. um, and so adrian marie brown and toshi reagan started the octavius parables podcast yes um where they chat so for those of you who have not read parable of the sower please read it um and I imagine someone in our challenge will read it, which means it will be in our library and it will be, um, we will have a giveaway of every single book that um, a person reads. So please participate um, right. in that. You can get a free copy. But awesome. um, yes, but the podcast is a great companion to, um, to folks who are, who are just now reading uh, Parable of the Sower. So I, I also picked it up at the beginning of our quarantining, social distancing, um, as a way to kind of um, ground and remember that the times that we are living in are not necessarily new, 
um, yeah. and that there have been um, those who have come before who have experienced and who have prophesized and um, have given us some tools um, to be in this moment together, you know? Right, tools. Yeah, I um, actually have a piece that I wrote called Octavia Taught Me 10 Lessons from Parable of the Sower. Mm. I would love for people to check out after they read the book. And it's like, yeah. it's, it's the lessons that I think Octavia, like the messages she was trying to give us through that amazing book. Yes, yes. I'll be sure to share that in our, um, in the Facebook event and on our website. For sure. Yes. Thank you for that. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, of course. Um, also, if anyone has questions, feel free to hop in the chat. Um, you can also raise your hand and, I, and unmute if you'd like. Um, this is an open dialogue. I'm just kind of setting the stage, but we're here uh, for about another 30 minutes until four o'clock Central Standard Time. So if things pop up, you have any questions, feel free to uh, chime in and ask. All right. So I want to talk a little bit about, it is, you know, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Day. People around the nation and the, the world are kind of celebrating and honoring the legacy of this man. Um, and I think what often comes up is the um, erasure or absence of Black women in the movement. Um, and, um, and, you know, their role in it, their role, you know, even thinking about Coretta Scott King and her role as um, not only his, uh, not only his wife, but also a, a, a mother of the movement, a person deeply engaged in civil rights work. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about, you know, the importance of uplifting Black women, both literary um, folks, but also thinking about this kind of larger civil rights um, history, but also this Black Lives Matter movement moment that we're in, like it all feels so deeply connected. Yes, it does. And um, for me, lifting up and like doing ancestral work is, it's a political thing, but it's also a spiritual thing. Like I feel like, um, and I think it's also a cultural thing. Um, I think it's, um, there's something very important about uh, studying uh, the history of Black women that have come before us. I think that's part of the reason, well, I know that that's part of the reason why I started the library, right? It's because I was reading like Audre Lorde and Ida B. Wells and Zora Neale Hurston um, and understanding that, whoa, like the things that I'm feeling, uh, the moments that I'm having, um, the the things that I'm up against as far as like racism and patriarchy and colorism and classism, like all these things that I'm battling are not new things, right? There have been people uh, before me who have dealt with these, these same struggles and had similar moments. So what can I learn from that? You know, how can I, there's this quote, um, that it's like they tried to bury us, but they didn't know that we were seeing seeds. Yes. And I really feel like, you know, um, our ancestors, um, especially Black women who, I'll say, this might be controversial to say, but um, Black women who didn't live um, as long as they were supposed to, I, I don't mm -hmm. I'm saying this correctly, but, yeah. you know, or like um, a woman like Zora Neale Hurston who yeah. died broke, mm -hmm. you know, in an unmarked grave. Like, part of the reason why we know Zora Neale Hurston is because of Alice Walker. Mm -hmm. So I think that work um, of lifting up ancestors, of paying homage to ancestors, to amplifying their lives, their missions, the things they've done, mm -hmm. um, I think it is... Um, part of a legacy of Black feminist work, and it's part of why I do it. Mm. And it's, it is frustrating when you look at movements um, or ideas around the movement, mm. and you only see like Black male cis hetero. Like you, mm -hmm. you only see um, a certain gender mm. and sexuality uh, being promoted. 
And that to me is patriarchy at work. <laughs> yes. So, um, you know, part of Black feminist work is dismantling patriarchy and um, deconstructing it. Yes. So, you know, part of what I like to do is I like to talk about Fannie Lou Hamer. I like, you know, I like to talk about Ella Baker. Um, you know, I like to talk about Sojourner Truth, um, Black activism and how it's always existed. Um, part of the work I do through my collage work and through my stop motion animation work is what I call like these little kind of um, altars that are in reverence of um, a Black mm -hmm. activist or cultural worker. So I'm not sure if I'm answering the question. You are. Yeah. I think yes. the, I think that work is super important. And one of the things I appreciate about social media is that it gives us the opportunity to do it and have that kind of be spread and retweeted or reposted mm -hmm. and shared and you know, some random young student, black girl, black person, scholar, historian will see a picture and see a name and think, oh my goodness, um, Daisy Bates. I've never heard of her mm -hmm. before. Who is that? And then maybe go to Google and do a little research and end up finding out about um, an activist from a certain time that they never knew existed, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, that person may look just like them. So that maybe lights a little fire in your belly and it maybe inspires you like, oh, maybe I can do something about this world because this person who was just like me and who looked just like me did something. Yes, yes, yes. That's all. There's so much in there. And I, you know, I don't think it's com controversial at all to name that there are Black women who um, died too soon, you know, for reasons um, that are fixable, right? For reasons that are systemic, right? That, um, and too soon and unnamed and unknown and, yeah. um, and so much of that. And I love, um, the idea around you, um, creating these collages of altars. It made me think about, um, I don't know if you follow Vanessa German. She's a, um, yes, I love <laughs> yeah, so I'm going to, toss her um, Instagram and her website in the chat too, because I'm just like, let's, let's elevate and highlight and celebrate all of these amazing black women doing beautiful work. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, do the work. It's like, it's art, but it's also sacred work. Like it's, yes. really, it's spiritual. You yes. Know? yes. Channeling, you know, we're channeling, we're conjuring and we're paying attention to these spirits who put so much into mm. our existence yeah. like all the work that they did I feel like you know so many black women have died exhausted have died poor have died mm -hmm. broke died lonely um you know have contracted different illnesses from just like the stress of being a black woman and being a activist and fighter and thinker mm -hmm. and, you know and I feel like okay they did that work so we like, just like you took the baton of the challenge and ran with it, I feel like they also kind of gave me this baton, mm -hmm. which manifested into this library work, yes. and which manifests into my collages, my films, this moment. Like, I feel like it's all connected. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, there's a couple questions that came into the chat, so I want to um, get those into the room as well. So um, someone asked, what was the first piece of literature that spoke to you? Um, and as I'm sitting here reading like books to my two-year-old, I'm just like, oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah. That, you may go far back. I don't know. <laughs> I wouldn't go that far back, to be honest. I would probably go back to like when I was a teenager and I first read The Bluest Eye. Yeah. And I met Pecola Breedlove mm. and I... You know, I was all, I was struggling with my own feelings of self worth, and you know, struggling with like a sense of isolation and feeling unloved and not beautiful, and just thinking, oh, if I could just change this one thing about myself, that would make me more appealing and more palatable and more loved and appreciated. And I really uh, related to that sad little character, um, you know. And when I 
we read it as a more adult, I was like, okay, girl, he's <laughs> like, it wasn't that bad for you, <laughs> you know, but at the time I had never read, um, a character that featured a black girl for one, yeah. mm -hmm. um, you know, and she was the main character. Mm -hmm. um, and she was a poor black girl who was also lonely. Mm -hmm. Like I related to the poverty and the loneliness 100%. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, I also understood the, the poetics of what she was struggling with. And I was just like, wow, who is this Toni Morrison woman? And, um, you know, I always call Toni Morrison like the gateway drug. I don't know if that's mm -hmm. respectful, but I feel like if somebody reads uh, one of her books, it'll kind of make them want to read more of them or yeah. books like them. Mm -hmm. And it'll cause like a tumbleweed kind of domino effect. Because that's what happened to me. And that's what happened to a lot of women I know, like reading... Um, the bluest eye and then after that I think I read like the color purple mm -hmm. and I was like oh my goodness another girl like me you know <laughs> and then I read like um I know why the cage bird sings mm -hmm. and it just kind of dominoed into just reading those type of books all the time as well as James Baldwin and Langston Hughes like and just feeling really excited and then I discovered um a lot of African authors like Chinua Achebe and Ayikwe Arma and Maria Maba, right? And Bucci. And I was like, wow, like, this is so cool. Yeah. Because my parents are Nigerian and I'm born in this country. So I'm, so I'm kind of like in between these two worlds. Yeah. Continental and very like black, mm -hmm. urban, American black. Mm -hmm. And I was reading all these different books and realizing that I, I was seeing different parts of me in all these different characters. And I was really affirmed by that because up until that point, I hadn't seen that before. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. I think, um, I think James Baldwin actually in high school was the first book by a black person I was given in the academic setting. Mm obviously my one was it um what did we read um if bill street could talk okay okay <laughs> classic yes a classic a classic and now we obviously have the film and the soundtrack is so beautiful so i just listen to that all the time <laughs> it's gorgeous but, it's gorgeous um barry jenkins makes some beautiful films yes there's another one coming out based on a novel by colson whitehead that i'm yes. Really yeah. about, but yeah. I love Giovanni's room. I think that's one of my favorites. Yeah. Wow. Yes. Um, yeah. I've just been I've been sitting with um, I'm not your Negro for the last few days. So James Baldwin's words feel very like present on my spirit right now. So yes. 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 Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> talk about another prophet, right? Another like. Yeah. Next so many level. next level there's a question around um joy right and thinking about what books bring you joy um do you have one or two or a couple that you're just like you read them and you sit and you smile and mm. well i'll tell you one book that cracked me up one writer that cracks me up uh, her name is samantha irby um, last name is I-R-B-Y and she writes I guess you would call them like it's kind of like personal essays creative nonfiction but she is hilarious okay um, I think uh, one of them is called um, No Thank You and I'm trying to remember the name of the second one but um, it might have an expletive in the title I just I just put her um, page in the chat and her the second line on her page is I have a blog called Bitches Gotta Eat. <laughs> yeah, she, and I'm already giggling. <laughs> that's the first book I ever read that made literally had me laughing out loud. Like I'd never laughed at a book in a from a book before, and I was like, wow, 
you did that girl <laughs> you really yes. you know it made it made me really happy i felt very joyful reading it um also i read a lot of ya yes and um classic ya is good but it's kind of depressing <laughs> Con, um, and some contemporary YA too can be a little bit like, mm -hmm. but there's some really good YA out right now. Um, there's a book called um, The Stars and the Blackness Between Them. Mm. And uh, it's written by a woman named Janata Petrus. That book is really tender and really sweet. And it really uh, just touched my heart. <laughs> it's so beautiful. If people are wanting to sign up to read as a part of this challenge, um, it is for Black um, women, femme, non-binary folks. Um, we will purchase the book that people choose to read. Um, the person who reads it will get a copy if they don't have one. Um, a copy will go into the Emily Taylor Center Library. A copy will go into the Office of Multicultural Affairs Library. And then a copy will be um, put in as a giveaway um, for um, people who participate in the uh, in the event. So um, it's really such a beautiful way to support this project. I was so happy to see. Um, uh, I was so happy to see that announcement and this event as well. I just wanted to say great. Yeah. Yay, I'm glad. Thanks for being here. Yeah. <laughs> yes, Adjua, that's my babe. That's my little yes. sis. Yes, yes, yes. Um, Hi. Hi, babe. <laughs> <laughs> I love this. Yeah, this is beautiful. So, um, yeah, we were just, we were just chatting um, about how, she was just talking about how amazing this is um, that, that we're doing this and um, how she knows you and so it's it's really wonderful to see you know just how we show up for each other I think it's just so telling you know um, yeah right now yeah yeah if people showed up for black women the way black women show up for the world the world would be a whole yeah. different place mm -hmm. that's what I that's what I think about all the time like yeah. the way black women organize and feed people and raise children and mm -hmm. you know so many things so many things like i witnessed it with my own eyes it's mm -hmm. like if like if that energy was reciprocal this world would be completely different so different <laughs> that's, so that's different. how i feel that's, yeah. that's how I, that's what i think but yeah. i don't know if it's a fact that feels so clear, you know? <laughs> it feel like right now in my mind, right now in my mind as you said that, I've I've maybe heard somebody say something close to that, but just now when you said it, I heard it as like a like a math equation. Like like, you know, like yeah. I could think like about, I don't I don't know ex hmm? Think about Stacey Abrams. Perfect example. Yes. 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 Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah perfect example perfect yeah. example i um i was this is like tangential but like i obviously i work in higher education and um you know am am one of few black women on my campus who work on our campus and we've just gone through a big divisional restructuring um that i personally disagree with um and um you know, I was talking about the massive amount of time that, you know, our, our division spend doing like Myers-Briggs and like understanding your like strengths quest and like your personality, like what color are you? And then they have like these two hour long meetings talking about like, are you INFJ or ENFG or whatever? And I'm just like, if you all spent this amount of time listening to black people dismantling white supremacy and patriarchy our institutions would function completely differently yeah um but we're yeah. concerned about whether or not we're yellow or green and whether that makes us good leaders <laughs> yeah yeah i can't help like, but laugh about it <laughs> yeah yeah because i feel like you know and part of my work with the library i think 
is what has exposed me to this. It's just like studying the movements, you know, studying the movements that Black women have led behind the scenes mm -hmm. and in front of the scenes. And even up until now with Black Lives Matter, even though like the shape of Black Lives Matter has completely changed and been co-opted, unfortunately, yeah. but in its creation, you know, the idea was to tackle state violence, which is a real thing. Mm -hmm. And the work that Black Lives Matter has done has exposed people to the fact that state violence is an actual little threat. Like, it's not just a random idea. Like, mm -hmm. it's an actual threat that you could just be in your house. I mean, trigger warning, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. You could just be in your house sleeping and mm -hmm. be a victim of state violence. Like, that's how extreme it is and I think black life you know it was a that's a black woman led movement mm -hmm. it was started by three black women yeah you know yeah but it's I mean it's yeah I think about SNCC like I think about the um Combahee River Collective yes. like, uh, which we know? should all just be going back to and reading all of the time all the time, <laughs> like, all of the all time. time. Yeah. You know, and I, and sometimes I have, um, you know, I have black men and men of pretty much all different races. They'll sometimes come to the library and they're like, oh, what book should I read? Mm -hmm. I want to learn about black feminism. What book should I read? And I appreciate that. I appreciate them doing that work and like seeking out resources because I feel like once you've started to, no matter how patriarchal, you know, or how, like, you might have internalized patriarchy, mm -hmm. even as a, as a non-man, after reading something like Sister Outsider, mm -hmm. it's kind of hard to go back. <laughs> yes. Because you're kind of like, oh, you know, or even, like, Bell Hooks. Yes. Yeah, it's kind of like, it's kind of hard to go back. Like, it's like, once your eyes have been opened, so... I appreciate the folks who actually like seek out those resources and read those books because I think that's the first step. Yes. yes. To reject to, re to rejecting all the mess. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, self-education is really important, right? And the minute we yeah. think we don't have anything to learn, I mean, we're talking on Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Day where he named that you know, the issue is white folks out here are thinking that they don't have anything else to learn or to do in the realm of talking about and dismantling racism and white supremacy. And the reality is there's so much more to learn and there's so much more to do. Um, yeah. 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 And I think, you know, I, and it's interesting, like the Martin Luther King holiday is interesting and I definitely appreciate the fact that it exists and that his um, legacy is being lifted up. But, you know, I do have some issue with the way, um, the way his message kind of feels like it's been like sanitized and made respectable on this day. And, you know, the different, the different quotes that people sometimes use um, when they want to like lift him up mm -hmm. because you know, it just makes me wonder like, were you lifting him up before he was made into you know before he was assassinated like were you about that life before and yeah i just want i just like would like to encourage people to just like read all of his speeches not just not just the i have a dream and really dig into his life and the fact that he was you know not like uh considered a respectable negro at that time like he was definitely like hated and villainized yes absolutely and um, he was also not like uh, Kumbaya turned the other cheek. Mm -hmm. At least later on, I think. Yeah. I think he was developing a different, um, different ideas around methodology and like abolition and. Especially after Malcolm X passed you know, or was murdered. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. So, so yes. Yeah. You know, I, yeah. Yes. The librarian, the librarian in me just says, do a little more research. That's my answer to everything. Research, research, research. 
Yes. If you don't, if you don't like reading, listen to audio books. Mm -hmm. If you like video visuals, go to YouTube. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Watch watch lectures and watch talks. Yeah. Different. You know. Yes, that is a great, yes, that is a great um, point. And if you are in Lawrence, Kansas, which is where I'm um, videoing from and connected to KU, the Lawrence Public Library has, um, you get a library card, you get a subscription to Hoopla, which is free audiobooks. Um, and so you can nice. their audiobooks. You don't need to purchase an Audible account um, to have access to audiobooks. And, awesome. you know, as a predominantly white town, um, they are really lifting up all the anti-racist literature right now. So, so, you know, take that opportunity to go um, listen to some of those, those free books if you have access to that. And I'm sure a lot of people's local libraries have similar similar things. So if you're not in Lawrence, um, check your local library and see what they're offering. Um, so we have yeah. about five minutes left. Um, and I wanted to just let you share maybe um, we're in this new year. 2020 was a lot. <laughs> yes, it was. To say the least. Um, <laughs> as you no. enter into 2021, um, what are maybe what are some things that that are grounding you as you are entering into this new year? Mm. Oh, wow. So many things. Um, one quick thing about the anti-racist literature, though, definitely read all of that stuff, but also read horror, read, read science fiction, read erotica, read loves, read books on relationships between women, read everything mm -hmm. by Black people, by Black women, Black non-binary authors. Okay, cool. Um, grounding me, my plants. I'm a proud plant mom. Tons of plants. Too. <laughs> and if you want to show me love, you can send me plants and books, but also send me plants. Mm -hmm. um, my plants are grounding me. Um, my yoga practice is definitely grounding me. And uh, my art making activities, my collaging, my paper making, my stop motion animation creations mm -hmm. are definitely grounding me. I'm a very like crafty person very introverted. I like making things with my hands. Um, I've t I took a weaving class recently, so now I'm really into fiber arts. Um, you know, uh, de and definitely writing. I've started writing a little bit. I'm excited about that. I took a writing workshop, and I, I might write something that the world sees one day. Who knows? Um, you know, and as always, reading um, is grounding me, and spending time with my daughter, who is like an incredible human being. And yeah, just uh, daydreaming. I'm a big daydreamer. Um, you know, I have a really beautiful view. I'm looking right out the window right now. I love to look at the sky and think about how beautiful and incredible the world can be and how things can shift and change at any moment. Um, so, you know, all the usual things. <laughs> You know, and yeah. I try not to overindulge in news. I'm definitely a news junkie, and I definitely find myself, like, sometimes watching CNN all day. And then I'm like, girl, what are you doing? So, you mm -hmm. know, just kind of ba being balanced in my consumption of the things that are going on and yeah. being balanced in my um, social media usage. And also, you know, crafting, creating time to... Uh, uh, intimate moments with other people, like mm -hmm. being able to like conjure moments of intimacy and vulnerability with friends is super important. So those are things I try to make, I don't force to happen, but I try to make them happen. Yeah. And yeah. That's, that's beautiful. Yeah. Those, those things. are all beautiful, amazing things. <laughs> Things that we can adopt as well. I know my husband was, was like, if I bring one more plant into this house, <laughs> Listen, plants are life. Plants are life. I'm really, tempted to, I'm really tempted to get a dog, and my daughter told me that sometimes dogs eat plants. So now I'm like, mm, do I really want a dog? Yeah, I have two, so I, I would pause on the, I'd pause on the dog. Buy one yeah, more plant. Buy another plant. <laughs> yeah, I definitely don't have enough. Yes, yeah, get some more plants. Yeah, right there. 
So if people wanted to follow your work, get in contact with you, what's the best way to do that? Well, definitely you can email me anytime at the free black women's library at gmail.com. Don't forget the, the, and you can also follow me on Instagram and send me a DM on Instagram. I love DMs. I, re- I that's the easiest way to get a quick response because sometimes they get overwhelmed with the emails. Um, and my website, www.thefreeblackwomenslibrary.com also has like a little contact form. Like if you want to contact me about collaborating on an art project or something like this, that's, you can write me through there. And uh, yeah, donate to the GoFundMe, please. <laughs> Do, uh, donate to the GoFundMe. I'm trying to raise $100,000 uh, yes. so, so that I can get a reading room for the mm-hmm. library. I want to create a space where all of the books can live and all the archives. I have books, I have zines, I have journals, I have research papers, I have cassette tapes, I have VHS posters. I have all these things that I would love to have live in the actual archive in addition to the books that people can come and look at and and use and take pictures of or be inspired by. Yeah. So, I'm in Brooklyn, New York, which is like the most expensive place in the world. So I'm raising money for a uh, space, for rent for a space that can be the reading room. And then I'm also raising money for an actual vehicle that I can use to get the books around. Because right now, the way I get the books around is through Lyft. Mm. And that is a serious challenge. Because sometimes they don't want to pick me up because they're like, where are you going with all these boxes? Yeah. So, you know, so I'd like to have an actual vehicle for the library that that I can use to drive around and it can be really pretty on the inside with all the books laid out nicely by genre and by author. That's so amazing. That's very cool. Yeah. Yeah. And then also a staff person because it's a lot of work. I've been doing this work for five years and I haven't been paid a dime. Mm. And I would like to hire somebody to help me and be able to pay them because I know from experience that it's work. (laughs) So they can help me like manage the books, categorize them, archive them, stay in touch with folks, Mm. respond to the 800 emails I get every day, um, you know, and teach me how to how a collection should be held and taken care of. Like, Mm -hmm. you know, I had to research how to take care of books because some of these items I have are super precious. Mm -hmm. I have first edition things. I have books signed by authors who, you know, who've passed on. So I want to make sure that they're handled carefully. And I'm not a trained librarian. I'm not a trained archivist. You know, I call myself that because it makes me feel like, you know, super special, but an actual librarian can Mm -hmm. you know give me some guidance and i want them to be paid so yes yeah that's what all that gofundme money is for so it seems like a large amount but it's actually not when you break it down to those three things Mm -hmm. (laughs) yes absolutely well many folks got that uh last stimulus check um and while everyone <laughs> may be struggling in a different way during these times, not everyone is struggling financially. Right. So if you have that stimulus check that you maybe don't need, you might think about passing that on to the Free Black Women's Library. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. One of the things I learned, one of the, sorry to cut you off. No, no. I was going to say that one of the things I learned from doing the um, Sister Outsider YouTube uh, grant that I started Mm -hmm. is that there are people out there who aren't poor, (laughs) you know, and are able to donate money. So, Mm -hmm. you know, I was able to raise like almost $50,000 for that grant. And I've given out like, I've given out that grant to hundreds of women. So I realized that, hey, there are people out there who actually want to support and are looking for good projects to invest in Mm -hmm. so you know social media taught is what taught me that so that's why I was like let me try to see if I can raise money for these things that I need yes absolutely absolutely well sending you all of the vibes for funds and 
um, generous donations. Um, and once again, just, we are so grateful that you put this together and that you're challenging us all to introduce ourselves to the voices of black women from around the world, um, from history to present, um, young and old and in all of the ways that we show up, um, in all of who we are. So, um, I'm so excited to kick off this challenge, um, on the 26th. Yay. Um, for those of you who are interested in, you know, reading along with us, I just popped in. You can register to attend any of the um, video events. We are going to be reading excerpts live. Um, and then if you participate, you can enter to win a copy of um, the books that are being read. Um, I'll be kicking us off reading an excerpt from Revolutionary Mothering. Um, and um, if you identify as a Black woman, femme, or non-binary person, and you would like to read, um, I'm also tossing the Google Doc in the chat. You can sign up for the topic that you want to read and let us know what book you want to read, and we will um, order them for our libraries, for you, and um, as our giveaway. Um, and so, um, once again, just That's thank awesome. you so much for joining us today um, on your day off. Um, we really do appreciate your time and your labor. Um, and uh, yeah, and we'll be in touch throughout the year about our challenge. Yes. yes. Thank yeah. you so much. Uh, thank you for your time and thank you for your excitement and, you know, your creativity around this challenge. I really, really appreciate you. Like, honestly, thank you. Yes, all you know, give all that credit to our assistant director, Meg Williams, who um, has been following your work, I think, for some time. And yes, thank you, Megan. Yeah, brought this to our center. And so we're super excited to be um, doing this in our community. And thank you, um, really <laughs> <laughs> um, And then we will be in touch with all of the readings and the books and the videos and you know, you feel free to share them as you want to help promote your... Oh, yeah, I definitely will. And I'm really looking forward to seeing the books that y'all choose because I'm being tagged in all these different posts of people who are doing the challenge. And some of these book choices are so good. They're yeah. so good. You know, I just finished reading Passing by Nella Larson. Yeah. So that's my first book of the year. So that's my book with a one word title. Yes, I love that. I have that in my library here. I should pick it up. Yeah. <laughs> it's, good. it's really good. It's mm -hmm. deep. I, I bet. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. Yeah, Nella Larson is great. So she is. Oh, and I just want to say thank you to everyone that showed up for this talk. Uh, thank you for being interested in my work. Uh, please feel free to send me a message, a DM, let me know what you're reading, what books you're loving. I'm always excited about book recommendations and I'm always curious to see what people are enjoying out there. Yes, yes, definitely. Thank you again so much. Thank you everyone for joining. Please feel free to follow the Emily Taylor Center for Women and Gender Equity. We're on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, ETCWGE. Um, you can follow our work, visit our website, um, and we will see you at the, at the reading challenge next week on the 26th. Yeah. Thanks so much, Ella. We'll be in touch. Yep. Bye, Bye everybody. Bye, everyone. Bye, Adula. Thanks for coming. <laughs>